Let's get to know ketamine a bit better by doing, I don't want to say a side-by-side -side comparison, but throwing it in the mix with a lineup, kind of usual suspect style. <laughs> and the lineup consists of other psychedelics. And I should just take a second to say that in my subjective experience, particularly, I don't advise this, but at the doses that sort of push you through the looking glass, which I think no one really needs to do. But I consider ketamine much more of a psychedelic compound at, at higher doses than I do something like MDMA. If we take as characteristic of psychedelic experiences at higher doses, ego dissolution, et cetera. Also, I wanted to harken back to something you mentioned, which was Salvador and A being short lasting, short acting. <laughs> and I just want to emphasize for anybody out there who is maybe psychedelic naive or not experienced that short acting is, is the most relative term imaginable when applied to psychedelic experience. <laughs> and I would say short lasting and earth time, yes. But let's just say if it's in the case of NNDMT or 5-MeO-DMT, only 15 to 20 minutes or 10 to 20 minutes. Like, put your hand on a hot stove and tell me only 20 minutes. <laughs> Just not that you'd automatically have a hot stove experience, but it may not and very frequently will not feel like uh, 20 minutes. So, to be aware of that. But if we look at other psychedelics, if we put ketamine in that class for the time being, or even just put ketamine by itself and then other psychedelics, there seem to be some, not all, not totally overlapping, but some similar effects. The release of glutamate activating, say, mTOR, affecting mTOR, BDNF, so brain-derived neurotrophic factor. What are some of the closest comparables that you've seen, and how are they most similar, and how are they most different? I think you captured the, the key point of convergence, which is these are... Structurally, these drugs are not at all similar. Yeah. Mechanism of action, these drugs are not at all similar. And where they converge, which is, you know, something you have to expect in the brain, which is just this enormously complicated organ, that where they converge is how they perturb the effects of microcircuits. And microcircuit being a cluster of a small group of excitatory and inhibitory cells that are, you might say, the transistor, if you will, of the tr transistor radio. In other words, the lowest level that has the superordinate properties that, you're, that you can study in relation to cognitive effects. So when you give a dose of ketamine, you do two things, mainly, three things. One is you do activate inputs to the cortex from the thalamus you're really disinhibiting them. And you're, you're inhibiting the inhibitory nerve cells, the GABA nerve cells. So you're locally reducing the degree of inhibition and you're increasing a little bit the excitatory input. Could you just repeat the effect on the thalamus? And I'll just say this, I don't know if it's the best metaphor again, but is it fair to say the thalamus is a bit like the traffic cop for sensory inputs going to the brain? It's like a relay station yeah, that, that through which everything or most things must pass before going to the cortex for processing. Could you just repeat the effect that ketamine has on the thalamus? So what I'm going to say about ketamine and the hallucinogens and the psychedelics, if you will, are going to be complementary at each stage of information processing. Ketamine is relieving inhibition in the thalamus, in other words, resulting secondarily in excitation, and hallucinogens, psychedelics, are stimulating thalamic neuronal act, the output of the thalamic neurons. So you have sensory information coming in, and the ketamine is distorting that message to the cortex, and psychedelics are creating a new message <laughs> to the cortex. <laughs> and uh, similarly, in the cortex, ketamine is relieving inhibition and thereby increasing activation, and the psychedelics are driving autonomously excitation, essentially, again, creating a new message. 
And so that difference has been one of the reasons that people have thought that ketamine sensory experiences tend to be more distortions of sensory experience. In other words, the walls are breathing in and out. My arm is now a foot longer than it used to be, you know, things like that. Whereas, oh, look, there's, there's um, a shining, glowing orb in the middle of the room that wasn't there previous, you know, from the psychedelic, right? A fully fledged hallucination. In that way, they're not exactly the same in terms of the microcircuit, but they both have as a common property this increase of excitability, increase in glutamate output, triggering the downstream neurotrophic effects, and triggering the regrowth of the synapses that had been lost in animal models. And so we see evidence, hints of efficacy in the Imperial College study and in the studies done at Hopkins and and, uh, some of the other trials, and a, a little bit of a stronger signal in the Compass data that's been released in the press releases. But we do not yet have data in the treatment-resistant depressed population, and there are a lot of reasons why we have different populations being studied for the different agents. But to make a long story short, Even despite all the differences in the clinical data at the basic science level, we do have this kind of common effect on on microcircuits and regrowth of synapses. And and that's encouraging as a potential foundation for the way people think about the potential therapeutic effects of, of psychedelics.